Good evening. I'm Dr. Stuart Drescher, and uh, it's my opportunity usually to host these meetings, but several times a year we have a guest speaker. Tonight's speaker uh, needs no introduction for most of you, but uh, for those of you who might not know her, Dr. Lucinda Bateman received her medical training at Johns Hopkins University and is board certified in internal medicine. She's one of a handful of uh, the top experts in the country on fatigue. And, uh, one of the few people who maintains a full-time practice in that area but is quite singular in that she also serves on national committees, does research, teaches both patients and doctors um, about the intricacies of fatigue and um, has unfortunately a waiting list uh, that bespeaks of the uh, uncommon uh, expertise that she has in this community. So uh, tonight she's going to present uh, formally some of the material that is most current, but we're going to start out with uh, a discussion and question and answer period. And so I would now like to present Dr. Lucinda Bateman. Thank you. So maybe you um, heard our initial discussion that I have a brand new computer I've been saving up. I haven't had a laptop for a long time, a new laptop. Went and bought myself my computer so that I could start working more from home because we have a new electronic health record in our office so I can do my notes at home. And when I got here, the connection to the projector uh, was not the one that works. So um, we're waiting for someone to bring another laptop. But in the meantime, I thought it might be useful for me to give you a little background on why we picked this topic tonight. And uh, we have a small group here. Uh, we may be recording this and posting it on our website. So um, I want to address some of the bigger concepts, but I'd also like to make it really personal. Because if you have questions, then it might be the same questions that other people would have in a larger audience. So the idea to do this talk tonight came about a few weeks ago when um, a, a pretty big controversy erupted in the advocacy community for MACFS in this country and maybe reaching further. Um, I have it all in my slideshow in terms of the dates, but maybe I can just turn to the dates and uh, share those with you um, while we're doing this introduction. But on, on September 12th, which wasn't that long ago, I received an email from uh, someone who is on the the uh, Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee, which is one of our national committees we'll talk about. Um, that was unofficial, but uh, asking me if I wanted to join in an effort to recommend to the federal government that we use the Canadian case definition for chronic fatigue syndrome to become our official clinical case definition. There were only a couple of people on the list at that point, actually, that when that email came to me, but I knew the authors of the letter, the people who had designed the letter and put the letter forth. And I wanted to support them and decided that I think I, th I thought I could support that effort, that we do like using the Canadian case definition as a, as a clinical criteria in the office. That was on September 12th. I need my glasses to see the fine print on this PowerPoint. I signed the letter, sent it off. I didn't think that much more about it, actually. And on Monday, September 23rd, um, Actually, I should back up that we'd heard a little bit about the fact that uh, the, the, uh, the advisory committee and the National Institutes of Health and the organizations that had been working with the CFS advisory committee um, had decided to offer the, a contract to the Institute of Medicine or the IOM to design, to look at the evidence and design a new case definition for chronic fatigue syndrome. That's the simple version. And there was a lot of concern and worry among 
the advocates and also people who've been in the field in chronic fatigue syndrome, that somehow this task was being handed off to outsiders, to people who really didn't understand about the illness. And I think that was a valid concern, and it's one of the reasons that I thought I would sign that letter, and there was that, that concern was expressed in the letter about adopting the Canadian case definition. So anyway, back to Monday, September 23rd, which was uh, 11 days later. I would almost forgotten about signing the letter because it happens, those kinds of things happen to me in the course of a busy day. I probably get 60 emails a day uh, in my office relating to work and relating to issues and advocacy. Um, and I, I got an email on my, or I, I saw on my um, computer an email from the, uh, from the listserv of the CFS Advisory Committee saying that the contract had uh, been granted and outlining the work that would be done by the Institute of Medicine to try to review the data, to review all the current case definitions, to include information and uh, input from patients, from scientists and clinicians who'd been involved in chronic fatigue syndrome, to try to examine the evidence base and see if they could come up with uh, something we haven't had, have, haven't had except the Canadian definition, which is a clinical case definition to use for uh, defining chronic fatigue syndrome. And I actually, my instinct, this was me and my computer. This was the listserv that came to me, and I read through it in detail, and I thought, wow, they are taking this seriously. I like that outline. It looks thoughtful. It looks like they listened to the CFS Advisory Committee. It looks like they listened to the things we've been asking for in our recommendations. And I thought, now's the time. Now's the time for them to take on this responsibility. It's time for us to get the help from larger spheres. And I just remember thinking that I was, that was great. I didn't think about the letter, honestly. I just uh, thought, wow, this is much better than I thought it would be. A, few, a little while later, I got a call from a good friend of mine, Suzanne Vernon, who um, is, the, is the scientific uh, director at the Seabirds Association. You know, those of us in the field all know each other well, all over the country, who are involved in research and advocacy. Um, and she said, what is this about this letter? Why did you sign this letter? And what I didn't realize is that very day, the letter with all the signatures had arrived on the desk of the Secretary of Health of the Department of Health and Human Services. So early in the day, the letter landed, this demand letter it landed on the desk. Later in the day, this listserv came out. It just all happened like that at the same time. So I explained the reason that I signed on to the letter and said, you know, but I just read through the statement of work and I really think I can support this effort. I think it's a good idea. And she said, well, what do you think the other signers on the letter think? And I said, I don't know what they think. You really ought to ask them. And that is, uh, and she said, can I tell them that we talked? And I said, yes. It was just a letter to the other signers, the other scientists and clinicians who had signed the letter to the Secretary of Health. Well, that started a major snowball effect, as many of you may know. How many in here are aware of the controversy um, and maybe have been reading about it? Okay. So I really look at this as, uh, first of all, sort of like that game of gossip where you start a story at one end and pass it through to people and it becomes a little bit distorted before it reaches the end. And the other is the power of the internet um, to expand quickly um, a single linear view um, and sometimes to pass on things that are not necessarily true or don't tell the whole picture. For example, um, it, I, I don't spend a long, lot of time reading blogs and, and other things. Uh, I just don't have time. Um, but I, it came back to me that there was some impression that Suzanne Vernon had called and manipulated me in some way to uh, change my mind. And that's just absolutely not true. It was my own personal decision uh, after reading the statement of work. It was my idea for her to contact the other signers and if you read the letter carefully, it doesn't put any pressure on anyone. The letter says we, we're interested as a nonprofit to hear um, if you change your position after reading the statement of work. And it said that um, you can read this. I, in preparation for this talk, actually, I was looking around the internet and I found a, 
wonderful timeline of events. I don't know if anyone's seen that, but it's a timeline moment by moment, day by day of the events and the, the letter that Suzanne sent to all of the initial signers of the letter. This is before the letter went out to all the advocates. Um, uh, is there and my letter and my statement. So anyway, as this got rather heated, um, I decided I would probably, it would be a good idea for me to make a statement about why I decided not to stay on the letter. I didn't withdraw my name from the letter. I just, I just voiced my support, after all, for the Institute of Medicine project. Um, and I was a little bit surprised to find myself standing alone, to be honest. I was the only one on the letter. Um, who stood by the new contract. And one of the things I'd like to talk about in my talk is why I did that and what my vision is of uh, what the, this project could do on the positive side. So anyway, I, I just uh, wrote out a statement, I think this was on the 30th probably, maybe September 30th, with that, within a week. We posted it on our offer website, it got picked up which is what I wanted. I wanted people to understand why I'd made that decision. Um, and then, since then, I have focused on work. I've been busy doing other things. In the meantime, there's been a lot of... Uh, I, one of the things I read said there was a great amount of contention between the two sides. And I don't have any contention at all, and I don't have anyone much on my side. <laughs> I haven't talked to anyone else. And the Seafoods Association took their own position actually the same day also. They had, they had posted something on their site that was cautious, uncertain, and sort of reflected their middle road ground. And then they uh, came out in support as well before they knew what everyone else's stance would be as well. So I think around the same time, people voiced their opinion and made their statements about what they would like to do. So. With that in mind, um, I'd like to stop and see if anyone has any questions about that first part of the story. Any thoughts or questions? Anything, I can take anything. We aren't necessarily, you know, um, you, you can be a bit anonymous because uh, the backs of your heads are to the camera, but if you have concerns or questions about that first part of the story, I'd like to maybe address them. Um, the question is, is the, is the storm and the controversy coming from uh, clinicians and scientists and specialists, or is it coming from advocates? And the answer is, it's a little bit hard to tell once things get you know, storming around the internet. I can tell you that I made my first decision to sign the letter in a bit of a vacuum. In other words, I didn't take time, do research, find out more. I just thought, these are my people, I'm going to sign the letter. And I think, I felt like that most of my colleagues who signed the letter probably felt that way too. Once the controversy became intense, there was a lot of pressure additionally applied to individuals who signed the letter and other people were recruited to sign the letter. But you know, unless, if you didn't if you didn't make an effort to look at the work statement of work and to look into the Institute of Medicine, and someone just said to you, this is horrible thing is going on, we need more people to sign. You can see that there might be a, a big upswelling of people supporting the cause without actually um, investigating what might be on both sides of the plate. And I think that is probably true of both advocates and the people who are considered as specialists in the field. You know, I've had a journey with, well, let me come back and say, I think one of the biggest fears, um, I can only reflect what I th think about um, other, other people's uh, concerns. Everyone has to speak about their own concerns, but we certainly understand that there's been a pattern of isolation among, for all of us, patients, and every scientist and clinician who advocates for patients and treats patients have been marginalized in their field and ignored and belittled and stereotyped. 
Now, I know it feels worse when you're a patient, but I can tell you it's death to someone's, it has been death to a professional's career to enter this field. And I am pretty uh, lucky because I'm not an academic. I don't work at a big university. I am not anybody's employee. My, um, I do not depend on publications. I do not depend on grants. And I really have very little to lose. And I sort of a, I, I'm sort of an island by myself, <laughs> with surrounded by my patients and my friends across the country. And it's very low risk for me to take a stand. But mostly, I didn't think about it. I just decided what I was going to do based on the information I had. But I understand the history. But what's different is, over the last 10 years, I've had a chance to interface a little bit with almost every aspect of what we consider the, the federal system. Um, first, I was on the CFS Advisory Committee, and that was quite an experience. Um, that was I did that for, I think, six years. Uh, and so I experienced firsthand um, the way we don't communicate very well and didn't have the support of most of the federal uh, government bodies. The NIH and the FDA and Social Security and all of the people on that committee, and then there were representatives. And believe me, I went to many, many meetings. I know exactly what happens in those meetings. And it was frustrating. We felt like we weren't listened to. We felt like we met up with barriers every time we tried to make suggestions. There's a long history of what happened in those meetings. But I've observed that more and more progress has been made in those meetings in the last few years. Their voice is heard, their, sh their recommendations have become stronger, and their, uh, their ability to function as a committee has grown. And they've, got, they've, uh, they've gotten stronger leadership, and there's just been an evolution uh, of that committee. In addition, I've had a chance to work with Social Security Disability, but particularly I do that here, right? I go to hearings, I deal with them all the time. I've gotten experience dealing with that federal body. Um, I had a chance to um, go to several meetings at the FDA this last year and a half. They've been uh, really, they've opened their doors and listened to patients, held workshops. Um, I went to a hearing at the FDA on behalf of Hemispherics. Um, I wasn't paid to go there. I went as a volunteer to represent the clinicians who who, um, who had run the, the studies uh, and to also speak up for my patients who were part of the study, both uh, the open label study and also the double blind study. Um, so and I also just went to a, a what's called a pre-IND meeting at the FDA. So I'm working with a group who is pioneering some drug therapy for chronic fatigue syndrome, and we met with the FDA to talk about how to pave the way uh, for these clinical trials and to work toward getting an indication. I'm actually involved in three, two, two projects um, of drugs in development that might get an indication for treating chronic fatigue syndrome, and we were treated very, very well at the FDA. Those FDA officials um, understand the illness. They want to facilitate moving forward. Uh, and although they weren't nicer to us than they were to anyone else who comes to those very tough FDA meetings, I felt like we were treated fairly and as though we were any other disease process looking to move forward. And um, the, the, the process with the National Institutes of Health, um, that's moving slowly in terms of the amount of money they're able to provide for research, but our very own researchers here in Salt Lake City received a million dollar grant to work on uh, gene expression biomarkers using exercise as a stressor there, most of the halfway through, a little past halfway through um, that grant, um, based on a study that was funded by the Seabits Association um, as seed money to get, uh, to, to multiply that and get researchers to be able to qualify for NIH grants. So my personal experience with these federal bodies and the, the very nice human beings that work there as individuals has gradually changed over the last decade. Um, I have relationships with those people that I've met. Um, my, my sense of how they see patients with this illness has, has changed. Uh, I think it's changed. So, and the other thing I wanted to say is the CDC. Um, years ago, um, the CDC was a small island 
Uh, the, C the CFS unit in the CDC was a very small island that I don't think was very respected in the, in the CDC. They had a small budget and they function doing epidemiologic studies and making the case definition. I don't think they made very much progress, but they did do some things that are very important. Um, I'd like to talk about if we had time to talk. Uh, but what's changed is under new leadership, under Dr. Beth Unger and her team, the Centers for Disease Control unit on CFS has made a dedicated commitment to tapping into the resources of chronic fatigue clinicians and patients with CFS through their study. They have come to our offices, they have reviewed our data, they have listened to our advice, and they are trying to do exactly what we ask them to do, which is to tap into the expertise of clinicians and, patient, and, and the expertise of patients instead of just doing their own studies. We can't ask any more. They are doing, I think, as much as they can do with their current budget. So almost all of the major federal bodies that seem to present a barrier to us are melting. The barriers are melting. And I really believe the time is right to incorporate, to take this illness into the normal realm of science and, and the support of the federal government. Is it a risk? Yes. Can we guarantee that the committee will come out with something perfect? Absolutely not. I'm not sure if you put a group of CFS experts in one room, they would be able to come out with a consensus about how to do a case definition for this illness. So those are the reasons that I think the time is right, that things are changing. So maybe that explains a little bit. Thanks for bringing that. Any other questions about that? Outline of the Canadian definition? Um, I'm going to show it in my slides. Uh, okay. so, yeah, in just a minute. Uh, yes. Um, see that there were so many people that signed the letter to um, adopt it the CCC. Why did they just do that? Why did they have to spend a million dollars on a committee to study it? I, I do. Sev several things. The answer is. Um, why can't they just accept the Canadian case definition and not spend a million dollars? First of all, I'm going to tell you a million dollars is nothing in the federal budget. Okay? Um, it, it's, a, it's a lot of money, but I'm going to show you some numbers and tell you that that is a very small amount of money. It would be a lot of money for us. I think we need a lot more money than that to do anything. That's number one. So I think we've made a lot of fuss over the amount of that money without understanding the scope of federal budgets. Number two is the Canadian criteria are our best existing clinical case definition. But in number one, they're not, it's not evidence-based. So this was based on experience and expert uh, intuition for patients, which is what we have to do when we don't have an evidence base. It was 2003. That was you know, 11 years ago when it was published probably 12, 13 years when it was first initiated and got going, we have had an explosion of science since then. And we should take the science that we have and the studies that we have and build an even stronger case definition. That's number one. That is my opinion, is we don't have to rely on something that was trying to improve on what we had with, you know, without enough data. It's, it's good. It does not, in my opinion, encompass all people who have who fall in the circle of this illness any more than any one of the one does. The next thing is I don't think the federal government will ever adopt as their definition something that was generated in another realm. So for them to espouse it, it needs to come through the normal process of I don't think academic academia would either. So there's ways that we create our definitions and the things that we use. And adopting that case definition would completely ignore the normal process of the way the federal government would adopt something or the way an academic would adopt it. They would have to make an exception for us and just accept something that was 13 years old and say, okay, we'll just take, take it. And I just don't think that's what we should do right now. Um, I think we should take all the data we have and take the best of everything and see if we can break new ground so we can make progress. 
we've had the case definition all this time. Just because the federal government didn't accept it does not mean that all of us didn't use it. We use all the case definitions, and none of them are adequate, actually, uh, for any one situation, in my opinion. Okay, I'm going to take my flash drive. So it's hard to know exactly how to proceed when um, I've already given half my talk. But can you even see me over this? I'm trying to decide what's the best thing to do with the computer and the mic. But maybe what I'll do is, is go quickly through the slides and we can go more quickly through the things I've already talked about and maybe it'll remind me of a few of the things I wanted to say. I put this slide up at the beginning because the picture on the top represents my college education in Provo. And I went to uh, BYU. Um, I lived there all the way through the end of my master's degree, actually. I did lots of different things. Uh, and I was a really good student. So I was really able to be the top of every class because I just need to figure out what they wanted me to know. And I could memorize it and put it back on the test. And I put this on here because when I went to Johns Hopkins, I walked in that domed building, and that statue on top was right in the dome of Johns Hopkins. And I thought, wow, I just came from Utah, where we are famous for this statue. Actually, both statues are replicas of the original sculpture in Copenhagen, which was done in 1838. But this represents to me what I, I felt at home when I got there in lots of ways. Um, but what the rude awakening for me when I got to Johns Hopkins was there were no textbooks. And I remember going to my class and thinking, how am I supposed to know what I'm supposed to learn? We got lectures by these wonderful scientists, people who were clinicians in Johns Hopkins Hospital, Nobel laureates, and I'm not kidding, they'd come in and just talk about whatever they wanted. And then we covered, we took exams that covered the field. And what a difference it was, right? Instead of just having a small box of what it was I was supposed to know, I was just, there was an expectation to quickly and efficiently learn everything and move on. That was the way my education was at Hopkins. Knowing the field was just the first step. And the most important things I took away from my education at Johns Hopkins were, were the encouragement to think outside the box and think beyond our current knowledge. We had classes on how to think differently than the current dogma because Johns Hopkins wanted to produce people that changed the world and changed the way we thought. To question our current practices, question our research results, and question accepted dogma and push the envelope. And there was a, a doctor that was held up as the person we should admire, and his name was Sir William Holsler. And his, his teaching was that the most information leading to diagnosis and treatment would be learned from the patient. And he was one of the first great clinicians that started to take a history from the patient and listen, instead of just the old, you know, cut it out, or here, take these medications, and this is Sir William Osler, and he was born in 1849, and he died in 1919, so this guy's been gone a long time. And I'm putting some quotes from Sir William Osler throughout my talk, because way back then, he had a vision of how we should study human disease. And he said to study the phenomena of disease without books is to sail an uncharted sea, while to study books without patience is not to go to sea at all. And the problem with progression in this field is we've stopped listening to patients. Because medicine has changed and it's gotten in a hurry and doctors don't have time and all the rich information that we need comes from people who have the illness. And this was more from Sir William Osler. Medicine is learned at the bedside, not in the classroom. Let not your conception of disease come from words heard in the lecture room or read from the book. See and then reason and compare and control, but see first. And all, you know who knows about this illness is the mother of a child with chronic fatigue syndrome. Because all they have to do is look in their eyes and they can see that they're sick. And I honestly wasn't quite sure 
what to do with this illness when I first encountered it. And this is just a little history. I started my internship uh, back here in Salt Lake after Johns Hopkins. I literally worked 80 to 140 hours a week in the hospital. I worked the first 12 weeks without one day off. And it was horrible, actually. <laughs> it's mostly in the hospital and in the clinic. And one of the ways I survived was remembering those things that I'd learned. That I just needed to get that information under my belt, and then I was going to be able to move on and go forward. The other person that gave me inspiration was my Aunt Beulah, who was a modern day Sir William Osler as a woman. And I took time off, actually, when things got too horrible in my internship to write her biography. And it re in made me, re enthused me to go back into that horrible system where doctors worked too hard and hurried and didn't listen to their patients. Um, but that was the time that I became exposed to this disease. When I moved back here, you probably know this story. My sister had chronic fatigue syndrome, and I really made a commitment to try and understand what was wrong with her. And as soon as my eyes opened, I started seeing all the other patients in the hospital. But these patients were poorly received in the hospital. But around this time, so just to give you history, the first case definition of chronic fatigue syndrome was called the whole Holmes Criteria. They were published in 1988 the year after I came back here to do my internship. And they were that was where the term chronic fatigue syndrome was born in that first paper. And it was meant to try to replace the old term of chronic EBV or chronic Epstein-Barr when we thought maybe all chronic fatigue came from Epstein-Barr virus. Turns out, this always comes around full circle, right, that a lot of chronic fatigue probably is caused by Epstein-Barr virus. But many other viruses and other things may cause the syndrome. And this is the Holmes criteria. Um, this was published in 1988. And the, they had major and minor criteria. And they said that in order to be called the chronic fatigue syndrome, the person had to have new onset unrelenting fatigue, 50% reduction in stamina. They'd be sick for at least six months. And then they had to have up eight of those 11 symptoms. You can see there. Had to be sudden onset. And they had to also have some exam findings, low-grade fever, not, uh, red throat, and palpable lymph nodes. Well, this was a little bit problematic. It was interesting. It was meant to be a research case definition, but when we started to apply it, guess what? We found out this was not a very good case definition because although it described those initial people in Incline Village who had that illness, there were lots of people who had gradual onset of symptoms. What do you call them? And there were lots of people who didn't have these exam findings. They'd been sick a long time. They didn't have low-grade fevers like they did in the beginning. And they didn't have a red throat anymore. And they didn't have tender lymph nodes. Does that mean they didn't have chronic fatigue syndrome? And the other thing was it was a little bit difficult to decide if someone was 50% reduced in activity. How do you decide that? You say 50%. How do you decide if someone's 50% um, in their reduced activity? So this was problematic. It's what we had in 1988. And while I was uh, about the time I went into practice in 1991, the next CFS case definition was published. They were called the Fukuda criteria. And it was a group of people who got together in the field from the CDC, experts who had been seeing patients, people who were trying to publish on the illness. And they tried to revise the criteria to be better. Oh, sorry, that was 1994. But I wanted to say in 1990 was when the fibromyalgia criteria were published for widespread pain in another realm. And in order to meet fibro criteria, you only had to have widespread pain and tenderness, those tender points. But guess what all those fibromyalgia patients had? They had these things in the red. They had cognitive issues, unrefreshing sleep, muscle pain, joint pain, headaches, and fatigue. People with fibromyalgia. Yet in 1994, the Fukuda criteria were published that revised CFS criteria and in this criteria, they said that we call it chronic fatigue for research purposes, chronic fatigue syndrome, if it had been thoroughly evaluated and there was no other explanation, if it caused a substantial reduction in activity, and if they had at least four of those eight symptoms, post-exertional malaise, the red ones I just read, sore throat, not a red throat, the feeling of soreness in the throat, tender nose. Well, these were better. But they proved to be problematic too. Um, what if you have a patient with 
severe fatigue, but they only have three of those eight symptoms. One of the biggest problems we have is most of us in the field feel, feel that post-exertional malaise should be a primary symptom of this illness, that it is probably the most predictive symptom. Yet, using this case definition, you can have all the symptoms but not have post-exertional malaise. So what do those people have? Well, guess what? They don't have a name for their illness either, and they wouldn't end up in this pot. But they're not the same as people who have post-exertional malaise. If you apply this case definition correctly, the patients don't have this case definition from depression, from MS, from some other illness, because the case definition requires you to exclude people with another chronic illness that could be causing their fatigue. So there's a lot of misinterpretation also among clinicians about how to use this case definition. And it arose because we don't have a clinical case definition. You know, if you have a patient who gets chronic fatigue syndrome, whatever it is, the real illness, and then they become debilitated and deconditioned, and they get overweight, and they get sleep apnea, and they develop diabetes, and they get in a car accident and bump their head, how do you know if they still have chronic fatigue syndrome, right, at that point? because the FACUDA criteria no longer apply to someone who also has other conditions that contribute to their fatigue. So that's why we can't use this very much as a clinical case definition. I use FACUDA, there's actually a paper, this is a paper that tells you how to do a thorough workup for other causes of fatigue. It's actually very good as an internal medicine um, exercise to make sure that your patient doesn't have some other problem as the cause, primary cause for their fatigue. But it's not very useful as a clinical case definition because real people have more complicated illness than this. So a clinician has to use their judgment about whether or not to give someone the diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome when they may have other contributors to their fatigue. So in my clinic, um, we, we decide if people seem to have FACUDA criteria and then we spend a year or two continuing to work on doing diagnostic studies, trying to understand what else is going on, treating depression if it's present, you know, making sure people don't have sleep apnea, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until we're peeling off the layers of the onion, until I can feel certain that I have another illness at the core that's really causing people's symptoms. So you can see there's good and bad in every case definition. This is a very valuable case definition, and I'm going to show you why uh, in a minute to hold that thought. So in 2000, I, wanted, I, I left my primary care clinic and opened the fatigue consultation clinic. And the reason I did was to learn about this illness and to learn about it from patients. And also, I had a commitment to raising awareness about this illness as a clinician. I felt obligated because of my sister and because of all the patients that I had taken care of. And I felt like I would never have but would not be in a position to advocate until I knew more. And I needed to put myself in my own chronic fatigue syndrome residency. So I opened the clinic so we could evaluate patients and anyone who's been to our clinic knows that we spend a lot of time really trying to understand everything about your health so we can learn about the illness. We do a chronological history to try to understand how the illness evolved and what the factors might be that might help us understand what this illness is at all. Put a couple of Sir William Osler quotes in there. And I also made a commitment to keeping one foot solidly in, how can I say, in academics and in the standard medical world. As though I could put one feet one foot out where all the marginalized patients are, and one foot in the world I came from, at Johns Hopkins, in an academic medicine, and just take it back into the world where all normal diseases are subjected to an evidence base and science, and we take normal care of patients. It's very bizarre that this illness ended up marginalized, and all the patients it, there's something very strange about that, and it happened for a lot of reasons. One is that we don't, we didn't have very good ways of measuring it. Um, the other, I think, is that the illness affects people's cognition 
and their ability to communicate and to function normally, which makes it hard and it's easy for people to stereotype and think, oh, they're weird um, or they're just depressed. It's also very difficult to communicate the symptoms of this illness even when you're fresh and able to try to describe. It also takes a long time to describe fatigue, pain, cognition, and there's not a lot of time in the medical system. So there are many reasons why this illness in the rush of the advances of medicine kind of got left behind. But the FACUDA criteria were used by the Centers for Disease Control to do two very important and pivotal epidemiologic studies that put this illness on the map. Speaking of the map, uh, the first one was done in Wichita and published in 2003 and the estimate after this big study where they called people and assessed their symptoms and brought them in and examined them and put them through all the, rig the rigorous workup of the FACUDA criteria, the estimate was there were at least one million people in the United States that met the FACUDA criteria. That means a million people did not have another explanation for their, their illness. And there were twice as many people who had all the symptoms, CFS-like, but when they brought them in, they found out they had another problem that nobody identified. So it was quite important. That makes three million people who are, who are sick and not getting good care, two-thirds of whom could be really helped by seeking medical help. And those set of symptoms somehow kept them from that. The second study used Vakuda with a few with a few twists, um, we might say, in the way they asked the questions and the way they defined the symptoms. And that's called the Georgia study, and it was published in 2007. And it shocked the world because their estimate after that study was that there were 4 million people in the United States that met the FACUDA criteria by those, uh, by those measurements. Um, in the Wichita study, the first one, they estimated that only half the patients had ever seen physicians for their symptoms. And then on average, only 16% of the people who met criteria had ever been diagnosed. That's just stunning. And it was more likely, they were more likely to get diagnosed if they were more wealthy or if their symptoms were sudden in onset instead of gradual. And a full quarter of those people were um, unemployed or disabled. So these were very, very important data that went in the literature from the Centers for disease control using FACUDA criteria to try to go out and study the illness. And the other thing that came from FACUDA criteria were estimates of the cost to society from this illness. The first conservative study was done by the CDC, and that's just productivity losses. That means the lack, probably loss of earnings from not being able to work. And then Lenny Jason did a study uh, totally indirect and direct costs. That means you include in the cost of medicines and the cost of insurance and everything, all the costs rolled together were 18 to 24 billion dollars per year to this country from this illness. So while we were impatient with the CDC for not moving forward, they were putting in the literature an important foundation for moving forward with this illness and understanding the severity of the illness. But we shouldn't be satisfied with any current state of knowledge or take any prolonged comfort in any base of evidence, no matter what it is. And the fault I would, uh, that, that I would uh, attribute to the CDC was sort of sitting on this too long, right? They should have taken that data and move on. And that's where they got kind of stuck spinning their wheels uh, until the new leadership. So this 2003 case definition uh, was called the Canadian case definition because experts got together in Canada because there were experts there. They all gathered. They said, how can we create a clinical definition? We don't have one. The FACUDA don't work in the clinic, the FACUDA criteria. So they came up with this case definition and what they did was moved post-exertional malaise to a mandatory criteria. So you could see in number one, they have to have reduction in activity. It has to be unexplained. Um, and post-exertional malaise and or pain is present. Now I have a little issue with that because fibromyalgia patients get post-exertional pain. When they go exercise, is that true? Yes, it escalates their pain. But most fibro patients do not have the severity of debilitation and fatigue and other problems that people with CFS have. And there's people in the middle that meet criteria for both. So when that, when that post-exertional pain got stuck in there on the 
Canadian criteria, I think in some ways it included many more patients that I think have another process contributing to their illness. It's an important process also, but I think it's different than what happens to people with CFS who have orthostatic intolerance and severe post-exertional malaise and activity intolerance. So anyway, the Canadian criteria require post-exertional malaise, require sleep problems, require some type of pain, including headaches, require neurologic or cognitive manifestations, and then some combination of autonomic neuroendocrine and immune. So you see it's a little different, but actually similar, but it really describes a very sick person with chronic fatigue syndrome a lot better. But it's not perfect. Let me give you an example. I see a lot of uh, adolescents who get post-viral fatigue and orthostatic intolerance, especially POTS. They do not have all these symptoms, especially when they first get sick. They just don't. Some of them don't have any cognitive complaints. Some of them, they, they may have too much sleep. Or, um, but it's problematic for me when I have a clinic full of people who need help and attention, but somehow there's a fight over whether they meet the criteria or not. So I'm the one who wants a broader circle with subsets. So we can include everybody who doesn't have another explanation and start to define subsets, particularly like this post-viral post fatigue and POTS group. This is a really clear example because they don't have a lot of other medical problems. So that's uh, what the, the Canadian criteria are. That's what we signed the letter to use. Um, but I'd like to say that while those are good, I don't think they're the best we can do. I think we should take all the data we have and see if we can do better. How we're going to do that, I don't know. Uh, this is just a diagram I did a long time ago. It's not perfect, but to sort of illustrate the point that there are a lot of people with fibromyalgia. Some of them meet criteria for these different case definitions, and the myalgic encephalomyelitis, the original ME case definition, describes the very most sick people and a much smaller total number of people. But even those people might meet fibro criteria. So these are Venn diagrams, and if you put your finger in any one spot, that person meets all the criteria of whatever uh, circles they fall in. Uh, the Canadian criteria are a little broader, the CUDA criteria are broader still, and then the empiric criteria are the ones used in that second epidemiologic study that, we, um, that showed 4 million instead of 2 million people. But some people have no fibro symptoms, some people have fibro on top of it. But, you know, I don't know if, if this is correct, and this is sort of my in way of, of doing it. Case definitions are just a construct to group people by common symptoms so we can study them or treat them in the clinic and devise ways to move forward. But none of them are perfect. The only real disease is what an individual has. Whatever they have, that's real. And their combination of symptoms are real and debilitating for them. So we have to think about it that way. So. The most important issues in my mind, there are two, and everything else hinges upon these. One is, we have a huge crisis in our country of delivery of health care to people with these illnesses. Primary care physicians don't know what to do. There aren't any specialists. We don't uh, teach it in the schools. Um, there are no diagnostic markers to use in the clinic. We don't have treatment guidelines that are published and widely accepted. And usually the, di the diagnosis comes very late for most people, less so in the younger kids because it's so obvious that something's severely wrong. We, we know something's wrong. But you know, um, this is the, the most common cause of extended absence in that age group in kids. It's the most common illness that causes school absences. And yet it's still not recognized and not diagnosed. And we've been trying to recruit for fibro studies in the pediatric population, and nationwide, the companies that have been sponsoring, um, the drug companies that have been sponsoring the studies cannot recruit enough patients to complete the studies because people don't diagnose fibromyalgia in kids. And yet we've been the leading enroller in the country because we have so many adult patients that we, by attrition, are able to get enough of the kids in to enroll in the studies. So we just, the lack of recognition and care in the regular medical community is just amazing. How do we get past that? I will tell you there's only one way to get past that, and that is for this illness to be integrated into academics, 
where every person who goes through medical school is taught all about the illness, the physiology, the way it presents. And do you know why we don't have that? Because we don't have an evidence base. That means we don't have enough published studies to be able to reach the level that are worthy of being added to the curriculum. Because there are standards about what's included and what's taught in medical school. We haven't been able to achieve those standards. What would it take to be able to do that? Well, it's going to take a lot by using the Canadian definition. It's not going to get us there. Adopting the Canadian definition is not going to make it more acceptable to academics to include this in the curriculum and make things happen, at least not quickly. The other major issue we face is a lack of science and research regarding these illnesses. We have some, but we lack a clear case definition. And the evidence is relatively weak. And that's because in order to have strong evidence, you have to have big studies and well-funded studies and placebo-controlled studies and all the things we aren't able to do because we don't get enough funding and because we don't have specialists who can gather the patients together. People do research, but they can't get patients because there aren't any way to recruit them because they're all scattered out with no doctors. So we have a huge problem for science. And we haven't really been able to prove our hypotheses about this illness, even though we think we know a lot about what's causing it, but we haven't been able to prove it very strongly, and not in a way that will be accepted by academics. So we have a real circular problem. And because of the lack of all of this, we don't have good funding. So it's my opinion that we will never conquer these two things without tapping into way bigger resources than what we have. And I just want to put up some numbers for you. This is, uh, I just got on the internet. This is the 2012 National Institutes of Health budget. It is $32 billion, the total budget. And I just listed here the budget for cancer. So remember, there's lots more in the NIH budget than cancer. And I just wanted to pick out breast cancer. So I put that in red. And you can see that every year, the NIH budget allows about 600 to 630 million dollars toward breast cancer research. Just hold that thought in your head. And remember, we were just gonna you know, spend a million dollars on the case definition, right? Um, I also looked at the Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Foundation and just looked at their audited financial statement for a year. It's just roughly equivalent year. They brought in, in donations, almost $400 million in that one year. And they spent most of it on services, research. But if you put together the $600 million in the NIH budget and the three dollars to $400 million in one major nonprofit breast cancer, that's a billion dollars in one year on breast cancer research. Now, I have nothing against breast cancer research, but we can do a lot better. And we are not moving forward in this field because we don't spend any money on it. How are we going to ever move forward with just a little bit of money spent? The NIH spending on chronic fatigue syndrome, you can see each year across the top total spending has been between three and six million dollars. And it's gone down because of the financial crisis and the budget cuts. So 2012 was about $4 million in NIH spending on chronic fatigue syndrome, which I showed you the numbers in terms of how it affects our population and the cost it is to our society to have this illness unaddressed, untreated, undiagnosed, and unstudied. So we have a major problem on our hands that needs major changes. And I do, how will we ever get patient care and scientific research for CFS at a level that matches other illnesses in the US? I think there is only one way to do it. And that is we have to involve the federal government. We have to make an alliance with all the powers that be, which then trickles to academics, because where do academics get their funding for research from the NIH, from the federal government mostly? I just wanted to, I had some slides in here talking about what we talked about early about the CFS Advisory Committee and the Institute of Medicine. I'm just going to go through them, but I just wanted to one, illustrate one other thing. For years, we were this insular community. This is the bubble that's us, separated from everybody else. I'm reading that Stephen King book, 
the dome. <laughs> we were under the dome. Um, no bio, bio markers, turmoil. Um, these stars are the patients, and outside, right, are all the other resources that we need. And yes, there's some doctors now in the bubble, and there are some scientists in the bubble, and some turmoil, and nonprofits in the bubble, and even the poor little section of the CDC got stuck in the bubble, but everybody else was outside. And each one of those outside institutions is critical for our progress. Academic institutions need the evidence base, they need to teach, they need to uh, make it so that we have providers. The scientists need funding, the pharmaceuticals, huge dollars toward change and toward drug development. The care providers need the information. Of course, the politicians just only want to talk about things that are popular, so we got to get more popular. And all the federal agencies that actually control need to be a part. We need the bubble gone, and we need connections to every one of those normal connections that disease processes have in order to uh, move forward. And after 20 years of slow progress and this insulation, lack of credibility, lack of cooperation, no funding, I really believe that in the last five years things have changed. We have more publications. We have, we're on the federal agenda. We talked about each one of those organizations and how they've uh, changed their tune. Uh, and been more supportive. We, we've had positive media, we've had more funding. Um, it really started with XMRV, the virus that we thought might cause chronic fatigue syndrome. And it really, the, the director of the NIH set aside a million dollars to do the definitive study. This wasn't all the studies, this was the definitive study and our group was a part of that. And I know a million dollars sounds like a lot, but when you spread it across three clinical labs and six clinical sites, and all the lab work that went on, it's not very much money. We ever, it's just doing business money. But we've had FDA drugs approved for fibromyalgia. We had the State of the Knowledge Workshop sponsored by the NIH where they brought all the experts in and put on the record our state of our knowledge. And we had a great uh, study in Norway about an immune modulating drug helping people with chronic fatigue syndrome that raised the question about an immune, an autoimmune, uh, portion to this illness that really got a lot of attention. Uh, you know, the federal bodies have adapt, adopted the term ME, ME-CFS, if you notice. Do you get online? Do you look? It no longer says CFS. It says ME-CFS. This is because of, of uh, insistence by advocates, and they've done it. They've listened. They've adopted the term. We had the FDA workshops, uh, the drug development workshops, and this one nonprofit, the Chronic Fatigue Initiative, had a $10, a $10 million budget to do a large study that involved all these clinics. That's happened in the last couple of years. Uh, we have a study that's about to be analyzed and published where we called a thousand patients and asked about their symptoms and the progress of their illness and that'll be reported in a paper. And the CDC is stepping up by doing their multi-site studies and they're publishing their data and we have just so much more information. And I believe we have what is needed for a, a venerable institution like the, institution of Medicine, the Institute of Medicine to take a look at our data and draw from all these studies and bring in the experts and move forward to uh, a place where we can uh, be creative. We can throw away the textbooks and we can start to think outside the box and make progress with this illness. So that's the end of my talk and um, we can take just a minute for questions if anybody has questions. Yes? why they adopted ME slash CFS so that maybe we can drop, finally drop, get people used to the term ME. But one of the, if you look at the, the work product of the IOM, it's actually to examine the name and make recommendations. 
Uh, my feeling has been we shouldn't rename it until we have something useful to say about it. <laughs> and it's kind of heresy, but we may not have one illness when, we, when this is said and done. We may have multiple illnesses, each with the more descriptive name. And um, we may peel away groups and be left with uh, leftovers that we have to keep working on. It's unlikely that we're going to solve everything at once. But progress is progress. And if we can take subgroups and start to treat them effectively and realize that it doesn't include another group and start to, um, see, I just think that's how science has to move forward. And I think once we're all engaged and taking care of everybody, nobody will be left behind. Um, we'll say, wow, this is interesting. This happened with fibromyalgia, right? All the drugs came out. They were great for certain people. And then it's like, hmm, we have all these people that don't respond to the drugs. What are we going to do with them? Well, we don't throw them in the corner. Uh, we did a study uh, with Dr. Light, and we took patients with CFS and fibro and put them on one of those drugs and did the gene expression studies, and it's going to tell us some important things. I can't talk about results just yet. But we can take, we can learn from negative results as well as positive results in any kind of study. Did I answer your question? Yes, yes, definitely. I think everybody knows that CFS is a bad word, <laughs> bad term, stereotyped, and I, I think it will probably evolve. Um, my, you know, although it's been horrible, when terms become accepted, you don't think about the term anymore. When you know the illness, it's when you don't know the illness that you draw conclusions from the term. It's like when someone has a a defect or a birthmark or something, and you first see them, it just sticks out at you, and that's all you can see. And once you know them, you, you don't even see it anymore. You see the person. And that's the way it is with this illness, so it, it may work itself out anyway as awareness of the illness actually grows and the stereotypes go away. But my guess is the name will evolve also and be much more appropriate. Let's just say that's a good example of the leftovers, right? Yeah. So fibromyalgia, the milder, more garden variety fibromyalgia that responds to exercise and getting good sleep and you know helping with stressors and getting on these drugs that help down regulate this amplified pain in the brain. I mean, I love getting fibro patients in the clinic because I can help them <laughs> as opposed to my CFS patients that I can't make better very well. I can support them and we can do some, but I can take a, a most an average fibro patient and really improve their condition. So um, in a way, we've taken a big, we've taken our chunk out of the middle, right? We have this big group and we've taken out an easy group and really learned how to help that group. Um, and remember that any of these terms, but we shouldn't think of them as the whole disease. They're really a description of people with common symptoms these case definitions. So there are many causes and illnesses of fatigue and pain and debilitation from viruses, from mechanical injury, from exposures, and then the body has many uh, reactions that have to do with your immune system. And they're really, even if you take people that fit under a common case definition, there's a lot of differences among them. And sometimes they don't even really see themselves in each other. They'll say, wow, you responded to that drug, I hated that drug. Right? So that shows there are really differences. And we've made the most progress in working on pain modulation in certain groups of people. So it's really too big of a question to answer, except for to say we're making great progress. And I think the progress in fibromyalgia is moving more quickly. And because sort of the dogma now about treating fibro doesn't help most people with CFS as much, um, has sort of left this group. and slowly, you know, the scientific minds and the clinical minds are saying, whoa, what's this group over here that doesn't respond? But that's what we need to do, right, is keep, we, people need to be like, they need to be seen by specialists, we need to have normal scientific and medical progress encompassing, you know, bringing in people with all these illnesses and none of that marginal, you know, marginalizing. And then we'll make faster progress.
I don't know. We'll have to see. Um, I think that the members of the committee uh, that I see representing the CFS community are really great people to be on the committee for various strengths. No one brings the whole package, right? Everybody brings a certain strength. Um, I don't know the other members of the committee. I've looked a little bit at their um, credentials, and they look great. Uh, it looks like they've worked hard to bring people on the committee that bring research experience and, I guess, and, and come from a variety of fields. Uh, the director of the committee is uh, young and um, successful and maybe very forward-thinking, so I don't know. Are you hoping to come up with a whole new case I, don't, I, I think we're just going to do the process. The process is to examine the evidence, right? That's how science should start. We shouldn't have a preconceived idea. We shouldn't say, we want to hold on to this, we want to hold on to this, we want to hold on to this. We should get neutral minds. That's the thing about the Institute of Medicine. Their job is to be an unbiased um, scientific review. And they bring people in who volunteer, who are elected to the Institute of Medicine because of their expertise or the, 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 uh, the many things they've done in their field. And they volunteer their time to help our country and to move science forward. I'm not saying they're perfect. I'm just saying that's what the Institute of Medicine is. They don't get paid um, to do it. And um, the idea is to have a neutral look at the data, to look at all the science, and to have neutral people come in who don't necessarily carry all the baggage and the biases that we carry, too. We have just as many biases on the inside as people who stereotype do on the outside. So the idea is to look at the science. And we've got some now. We've got some great numbers. We've got, so I wanted to put those up there to say that right now, hopefully they won't be slightly delayed. We'll be able to use them. But the numbers support what we should put in the case definition. Our numbers say how many people have post exertional delays, how many people's primary symptoms go across the board. That's what the science can tell us. And those studies that have been going have those numbers. So those things can be incorporated into a clinical definition. They don't have to reinvent the name. It doesn't have to determine who we pick for scientific studies. The intention of this particular committee is to form a clinical case definition, to give doctors in practice tools to identify patients and take care of them. That's the goal. That's what a clinical definition is. This is the way you should see, this, these are what these patients will present to you like, and here's, uh, you know, and, and then we can start to develop guidelines. If people have these criteria, here's what we'll do. We don't have any of that now. And we won't have it unless it comes through a body uh, with authority. That's why we haven't made any progress for all these years. So can we guarantee anything? No. All we can do is trust the scientific process and hope it works better than, than, than what we have. And you know, if it doesn't, the thing is, I love that one quote in there which said that the best thing about a skeptic is they can laugh at their mistakes and realize that, that, that there's always a new invention, that we can always look at things in a new way. So if it doesn't work, we just reinvent it. We just do it again. Yeah. <laughs> So in case you, you couldn't hear that, that, Linda's question was, do I have a personal opinion of what causes CFS? Well, first, I want to say something that's heresy. And that is, everyone thinks their illness is true CFS. There is no true CFS. There's only all these manifestations of illness. The only real CFS is the Holmes criteria, right? That's where the term was coined. 
So we all have our view of what should earn the title of real CFS. Even providers talk about true CFS. Well, there's no such thing as true CFS. There is, There are real presentations of illness we need to understand, but the term CFS is purely an invention that we put in a publication. And as we've changed the case step, we're changing them because they don't fit, right? And everyone won't fit until we have a diagnostic study. So if you can draw the blood and say everybody with the CBC of this, you know, I mean, a white count of this, we're going to call them that. As long as we're defining it in these ill-defined ways, we're not going to be able to have an absolute about what illnesses are. So that question is um, too complicated, right? What do I think causes CFS? Well, it depends on which CFS you're talking about, right? And I do have my opinions about all the subsets and all the interface because I have a really wonderful opportunity to view the entire spectrum in my clinic. Every age, every stage, every presentation across the entire spectrum, I'm really unique in that way. I feel like it's a great blessing to me, but it makes it a little more confusing. Right? It's easy to be dogmatic, but the more you know, the harder it is to be dogmatic. So really, and this is something that's been said in the field for a while, the only answer to being dogmatic are objective biomarkers. And then we can be a little bit more dogmatic. We can say, everybody who has this biomarker finding, we're going to call this. But and even then, we don't know for a long time if it comes and goes over time, if it's only in the beginning, if it only shows up at the end. So we have a long ways to go long ways to go. So my view is rather than uh, being angry and infighting and holding on and putting our candle under a basket, right? we need to be open and progressive and adventuresome and we need to include everyone in every idea because that is the only way we will make progress. And there are so many ways to make progress that we shouldn't be shooting down anyone who's working in the field. We should let everybody do what they're doing and let it all uh, lead to a, a much larger answer. That's my opinion anyway. Well, thank you for coming. Um, I need to get to a basketball game before it's over. So I'm going to take off. But um, I hope this was useful and helpful. Um, and uh, we'll all just keep going in the fight. <laughs> <laughs>